past. So then, then the panel, that, that scrutiny is done <coughs> when they actually um, apply under the vendor panel. Well, no, it's a public yeah. tender, but the information they give us, and then we go and on check that with other specialists and, and vet that as well. That tells us whether is it actual factual or not. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing I'd add to that as well is we also have project trust account with this contract. So we're all very familiar with what happened with Rikon and the original prison community house. So we, we front load our testing and we back end our process by having and the project yeah. trust systems, I'm assuming yeah. that's the new PDA. So I know when I started in council in 2018, yeah. we had project bank accounts. <laughs> it's My understanding is the new framework. Yes, it is correct. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. But it's the same concept. Same concept. Subbies, plumbers, all our tradies, um, they're not going to miss out. Yeah, and, and I'll give you an example if that's okay mm -hmm. through your chair. Um, so we had project trust accounts on the community house. We would view the payments to the subcontractors and if there was something we didn't think or we wanted to ask a question, we would ask a question directly to the subcontractor and they would tell us that that's okay. So, so we have good visibility across the payments of subcontractors. Yeah, there we're. Yeah. Now I noticed under the risk and opportunities you've covered material price increases, which is probably the most yes. pertinent cost that a builder may incur over the, 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 the time span of this project. What is yeah. the time span of the project and how are we covering? Uh, so our intention is to. Increases? Our intention is to complete the project by end of December. Uh, that will <coughs> probably go into January. Um, in terms of the, our, how we mitigate that is really if we can rapidly award the contract, the contractor then locks in their subcontracts. So once they've locked in a subcontract, that rate is, is on it. it. It's when a, con a main contractor doesn't lock in their subcontracts, that's when they often have an issue where, where they don't award rapidly they leave it go a couple of months, and within that time, there's a price difference between what they tendered at and what they then award their subcontract at. And that's where they often get into an issue. Have we so, got this successful uh, contractor before? We haven't, no, but um, they do come well recommended, um, and all their referee checks were good, um, and they use um, a good proportion of, because it's a design and construct contract, there is a good proportion of local contractors in the design and the, and the construct team. And the capability and availability to deliver by yes. the set time frame is acceptable? Is acceptable, yes. And we were around <coughs> looking at the um, costs, remaining project elements, including contingency at 725, yep. which represents roughly about 30% of total cost. Yep. Um, is that enough buffer? So we talked, to, it's a lump sum contract, so it's yeah. not rise and fall. Yeah. Get what you just said about, you know, you lock in your trades ASAP, so mm -hmm. there's a price, but there's still risk that prices will increase. That yeah. contingency covers um, the possibility that there may be, yeah. although we've done all due diligence and um, factored that in, but does that contingency also consider that there may be, even if it's a slight possibility, that there might be an yep. unforeseen rise in material costs and supplies, no. and as a council we would then be reasonable to the builder to ensure that they can continue with the job and allow? Oh, we, we would always ensure that the contract can continue, uh, whether there's um, the contingency for all possibilities is another thing, and we would just need to work with the contractor mitigate where we can if it's a particular product is going to cost more and there's an alternative that doesn't have that impact we would always try and, and do that maneuvering as well as if we can so we try to to maneuver before we then have to try and put our hand out for more money or go beyond what the contingency allowances were um yeah i might jump to the contingency closer to 40 percent but you said it's yeah adam you mentioned um soundproof Yes. Because um, the existing, well, the old community house was notoriously poor for acoustics. Yes. Um, road noise. Uh, yes. So forth. So the collab space, which is going to be in the new addition, yes, is going to be like a lecture theatre with retractable seating. Is that correct? It. Is, I can explain the construction technique, and if Chris wants to add to yeah. to what the use is, but um, as we all know, the old house, and I worked on that many years ago, and you know. You need to build for what your intended use is in the location you are. And we all know how busy that is. Um, and the, the uses where noise is a prior, noise mitigation and management is a priority, the only solution there is a concrete floor 
concrete infill walls and a concrete roof. We do aesthetic treatment to the outside, mm -hmm. but that is the, the construction. And obviously there's further, further acoustic refinement internally, but, but that is the construction which keeps the noise out and, that, and that's what has to yeah. be constructed of that. And there will be further improvement in the existing houses there as well. You know, linings will be replaced and, and insulation added in places as well to improve that. And this is where the technology to predict, predict detect, monitor and fight fires will be run from, trialled and run from? Correct, I'll hand that to Chris if you like. He can give you a good explanation of it. With the Chair, uh, Councillor. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's going to be a multi-purpose facility. And um, you just asked some questions about the new COLA facility. And mm -hmm. I think it's probably worth just contextualising that. Um, I think uh, all of the councillors have attended various events and functions that we've held in the current collab, uh, and indeed a huge amount of the value that's been created by the digital hub has been created out of that small space there that uh, we've leveraged uh, to the very fullest extent. There's never really a purpose-built facility uh, f uh, for that, so um, uh, the educational activities, the kind of conferencing activities and so forth, we've managed to get them done. but. You know, with a with a, a more suitable facility, there's a lot um, a, a better um, uh, activity that we can deliver out of there. So, uh, our vision is to create something that's more purpose built, that can accommodate more people more comfortably, less running around, tapping on laptops, and and better AV uh, built into it, um, and something that can be can have a higher level of usage, independent usage, so that we can generate some additional revenue out of it. Uh, so that's. A, a sort of replacement for the current collab facility and what that will do is free up some additional um, working space and some additional revenue for us out of the existing facility. In terms of the uh, fire tech activities, um, uh, if we just describe the new building that we're putting on the north side of the current Perigian community house, the existing facility is being renovated to accommodate some of the, uh, the data lab uh, facilities. Or, or, or capabilities. So um, we have the notion of a, a sort of command century type room where you'll be able to come in and see a lot of screens and see data collected, being collected from our environment about um, bushfire risk, uh, uh, a vision from the detection cameras and so on, uh, and then be able to collaborate with people um, around that data, potentially remotely or in person. Uh, and then a smaller facility for media production um, we have quite a number of, of members and, and people in the digital ecosystem now who need to produce you know, podcasts, small videos and so forth. So having some facilities on site there is another uh, small use of that. So the collab for the sort of functions that you're familiar with that we run there, a data lab for, for data uh, visualization and, and, and link to the fire tech project, but not exclusively used by that. Uh, and then a sort of studio mm -hmm. capability for me media production. Those are the three sort of main pods of that uh, mm -hmm. of the new facility. And ultimately, one of the outcomes of the work that's taken, going to be taking place there is that the nursing community won't have to be disrupted by fires in the future. That's so very much the detected hope. Detected early and addressed early. Very much the hope. That's correct. That uh, as part of this fire tech project, we mm -hmm. can uh, use those facilities to help trial these new technologies, and that those those solutions will help us build resilience not only in, in, in Noosa but in other LGAs that can follow our, um, uh, uh, our best practices that are developed through that process. Okay. And a minor process question, the 2016 MCU mentions an addition to the existing, to the old mm. community house of 115 square metres, this is about 175. What's the process by which this will yeah. happen? You've got to design and construct pro um, yeah, so the process that's happened to date is um, we've sort of kept in contact with our planning team in council, um, so they've seen these plans before. Um, but once we go into, and there's no issue there, but once we go into the contract with the contractor, which is a design and construct, so, so that, you know, they have to refine our brief. Once those plans are finalised, we then submit that for a minor changes approval. Yeah. Um, but our, our, um, our discussions to date are that you know, that's in, a, in accordance with what? Entirely consistent. Entirely with consistent yeah. with the land use, et cetera, on that side. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So as far as the existing building goes, how much of it's retained? Anything? All the existing building is retained, yeah. uh, and we're adding on to that. The existing community house building? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
an internal renovation within that, that main structure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item two is the Shire Reseal Program. I'm assuming. Larry? Yep. Sorry, I'm going to do it. Alex is online. Alex is online. Sorry, there he is. Pick that up. Good afternoon, all. G'day, Alex. Would you like to give us a bit of an overview on the Civil Work Shire Reseal Program tender attendance? Yeah, sure. <coughs> Um, so, as you may be aware, the, the resale program is Council's uh, second largest contract behind the waste contract. Um, uh, the, the current resale contract that we have in place has been in place for five years now in the same format, so an initial three-year term with a plus one, plus one option. Uh, the contract for this, um, uh, this tender has been split into two separable, separable portions due to, due to specialised equipment and plant for uh, both ash building and bitumen sealing. Mm -hmm. And a draft uh, resurfacing program was developed and supplied to the tenderers for the next three years uh, to help um, give them a strong um, base that they could su uh, submit a schedule of mm -hmm. rates to. Uh, for both uh, separable portions, a scenario was then developed using these schedule of rates um, to create a, a bottom bottom line figure that we could then assess each tender against each other. So, um, based on bottom line price as well as the non price components, um, we've submitted the the following recommendations that portion A be um, awarded to all road surfaces and portion B uh, to RPQ. Very good. Questions, Councillors? I, I just had a, a question um, for, for anyone who might be reading this and doesn't know the background. Uh, I just question of why the the um, the dollar amount for the the tender was not included in the report. And if, unless I've missed it, I'm sorry. Uh, I is that for the budget? Sorry, Frank. Yeah. Uh, I believe because at the time uh, I wrote this report, the budget for um, the next financial year hadn't been adopted. Yeah. So the tenders so rights is quoted on page twenty. How are those values? And what are those values based on then? Apart, apart from the the schedule of rates, what sort of volume of uh, of road service delivery would they? Uh, uh, apologies, is that attachment, uh, attachment one? Uh, page 20 to me, which is the... Attachment oh, two. Attachment two, point, portion A. <laughs> so portion A uh, was a, basically we, we created a scenario which for this case was Beckman's Road. Um, that was on our next year for the program, in our draft program. Um, and so using the schedule of rates, we've priced mm. that job based on what the, each tenderer has su supplied. And that gave that, that figure. Okay, so Ash All Road, um, they tendered at 919,000, is that correct? No, so it's, not, it's it, this is based on a scenario. So this is this is an ongoing program, a three-year program of, of works, yeah. and those roads may change over that period. The ones we do, because other other roads become a priority, or you know that the schedule of works changes. So they charge as they go. They? Yeah. So this is this is based on a on a on a hourly, hourly rate or a or a, or a, um, a services rate, because we've got a, a, a rolling program. So the, what we did to try to get some some level of, of um, comparison is to say, here's a project. How much would you would you cost that at based on their schedule of rates? And then we use that as the as the model to choose. So this is covered within the five point three million. We've Absolutely. So so in terms of the overall program, yeah, we've got a, we've got a, a lump five point three million dollars worth of work to do. I understand. Yeah. And a, and a schedule of of projects to do but that schedule could change based on yeah. whatever yeah. happens over the next <coughs> year two years three years yeah. 
um, and priorities and, and the way things roll out. So it's so when you say there's no figure in there, the figure was the, is the budget figure. Okay. That's the 5.3 million. Yeah. And then we use these guys to deliver the projects within that, and we'll spend that total mm-hmm. amount of money for the projects that we've got, okay. and, and you know massage that to make sure it fits into the into the total project to okay. total. I understand better now. Thank you. Okay. Why is it that some contractors, <coughs> some um, tenders, that have got no value against their tenders price? Is that because they? So for portion A, uh, um, RPQ, they've got no price there because they didn't su- submit a schedule of rates okay. for the asphalting com- components. Yeah, they only good. did the portion <coughs> B components. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. The same contractors on both. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, Alex, I noticed, and I was very pleased to read, and I'm trying to find the paragraph, the council on page 14 under portion 2A, the council currently prefers the use of poly modified binder asphalt, but for working with the regional roads group, comprised of Sunshine Coast, Morton Bay, Noose and some state councils, as well as DTMR and LGAQ, collaboratively working with industry suppliers to provide a cost effective green asphalt that would be more environmentally friendly to produce without compromising on beneficial characters of the road surface. Can you give us a bit more of an insight into where that's at? Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's an ongoing standing item uh, within our technical regional roads group. Uh, and that's one that we're, we're all very uh, intrigued um, and, and I suppose pushing towards to get that solution. So currently um, the industry standard is to use an A15E poly modified binder asphalt. Um, which basically is done for, for cost and asset longevity. Um, but the, the push is always towards developing that green asphalt um, that, that's more environmentally friendly. Um, and so basically in us doing it, this is a schedule of rates contract. Um, we are not sort of limiting ourselves to one treatment and then blocking out the option that that we can go to a greener treatment in the future. There's always that option available to us when, uh, when uh, a suitable asphalt is available for that. Thank you. Uh, certainly, certainly something the uh, the previous chair of that regional roads and transport group was pushing very hard. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we won't we won't name them. Won't name them. <laughs> <laughs> Any further guess? No, thank you. So today I'm presenting to you a new governance framework for Council to consider and adopt. As you all know, governance helps us to always act in the best interests of our community and organisation. More specifically, it can help improve our performance and unlock new opportunities. It can also reduce risks, improve reputation and foster trust. In other words, governance is the process by which decisions are made and implemented. An organisation achieves its goals and produces its outputs. And the way our council is directed, controlled and held to account. By extension, the concept of good governance is necessary here um, to ensure accountability, consistency and transparency um, and to support our council to make decisions and to always act in the best interests of our community. So within this context and in response to our corporate um, plan goal, which requires us to strengthen our governance framework, um, this document has been prepared to provide a holistic and strategic overview of our current governance practices. So the framework in essence is based on our local government principles as well as our key governance commitments. So it goes a little bit beyond that, um, which lays the foundation for good governance to incur and includes concepts that you'll see in the report such as accountability, transparency, following the rule to participation inclusion and consensus orientated decision making. 
So in further detail, the framework provides our vision, values and culture and how they interact at all levels for anyone to see, clear definitions and delineation of roles and respective responsibilities of the council, councillors, mayor, CEO and employees, our current governance arrangements broken into the various topics in the document, as well as the essential requirement for ethical leadership, decision making and accountability. And to be clear, Council has always engaged and practised good governance. We do this every day. We're doing it right now. Um, this framework simply acknowledges and formalises such practices that are occurring by providing a comprehensive high-level account of how we apply our governance principles to achieve good governance. So in essence, it's a fundamental cornerstone document for our organisation that reflects our existing practices for anyone to view. Um, and in addition, the framework has gone through extensive internal consultation at various levels. It's been reviewed by the Audit and Risk Committee um, at a draft level, um, and external consultants have all um, reviewed it as well and been quite supportive of the content and the direction we're proposing to take. So by comparison, to give you a sense as well what everyone else is doing out there, research and discussion shows that various councils have already established and formalised their governance frameworks. And they're using this kind of document as an educational tool for staff and the community to understand good governance practices. So it's all about increasing transparency and awareness out there. Um, therefore, it's hoped that this framework, our framework, will inspire that continuous improvement of good governance practices and ensure that we continue to deliver the best possible services for our community. Well, we've, we had, we've had our governance framework in place. You know, we'll always have a governance framework in place. What's changed in, to, in we've this, never had a in this document? Or, yep. or, or you know, what are the major changes or the major improvements or enhancements? <coughs> So through the chair, we've never um, actually had a formal governance framework document in place. We've had elements of the framework, a framework on our website uh, being alluded to, but nothing that really contains it all into one holistic document. And this is, this is going to be a new piece of work, yeah. Mm. Hmm. Di, I really appreciate the document. As you mm -hmm. said, it's... it's, it's it integrates all the governance practices that are currently <coughs> in place within the council, and it is an educated document as well. Um, from your perspective, what areas of governance do we need to improve upon? Um, I don't think there's any particular area. I think, I think as you can, <coughs> as, as I've alluded to, this is currently happening. All mm. these elements, so. Um, to be, to be honest, I can't really point to something saying we're it's lacking. It's a question to put on, <laughs> on you at this point. It's, it's a big question. Mm, it is a big question. But, but, I, but I mean, it's, it's also, I always believe it's an aspirational document. Yes, You've got it this, is. it doesn't mean everything's great. It's something you've got to continually work at mm. to make sure that these processes are occurring and there's no lapses and you're monitoring mm. and mm. striving for constant yeah. improvement. Um, so that's why I ask the question, this must be some area like risk mitigation? Or yeah, and you better. will see elements, I, I think you're right, um, we are constantly evolving and improving. You will see elements too of the framework come up to future council meetings as well for uh, improvement um, and uh, risk is one of them. So you'll see a new risk management policy in the near future and that is a key foundational component of our governance framework. There will be other policies as well that will come up. So um, in essence, yes, we're constantly striving to improve. Um, and we, you know, those foundational elements will, will keep evolving and adapting. And as we change as an organisation too, this document will change too. So it will keep reflecting those improvements. Yeah, yeah just because we have this framework doesn't mean it's job done. It's That's done. right, yeah. yeah, it's a live document. Yeah, <coughs> it should reflect our current profile as an organisation. I know that Human Rights has been, uh, has been mentioned here, the Human Rights Act 2019 for Queensland uh, being introduced. I know mm -hmm. we've, we've had that before Council in the past. Yeah. That's, that's been incorporated in this document. That's as well. right, yeah. Yep, so this is a high level kind of aerial view that incorporates all those elements and I guess um, machinery components that form governance, good governance for our organisation. And I don't necessarily have the finance elements here. It says any costs associated with training sessions to support the framework 
Maybe you saw from Council's corporate training budget. Look forward to seeing the spending. Yeah, council is totally Actually, and I'd like to see the elements associated with good governance. Thank you, Councillor Jurisovic, as I've duly noted, and uh, we are on notice to spend that budget this year. <laughs> um, I've, I've got a couple of questions, Di. Um, first of all, um, that document, and I think it's really important for the community to have this document, mm. as important as the council. It's also um, just a really good reference point for anyone in the community that want to check what our obligations, duties, responsibilities, whether we, what our legislative compliant requirements are, whether we are being run efficiently, sustainably, etc. So um, I recommend this document um, to anyone in the community to understand um, what a conflict of interest is, what, um, there's so much good information in here, not just for us, for everyone in the community. Um, the, the only thing I, I'd like to note, and I note the recommendation authorises a CEO, if required, to make any minor amendments to the documents. Um, I would love, and this is just a thought as I'm reading and making a million notes, um, that on page 13, there are four key ethics principles. Um, and I note on page 12, our values. And given that our vision is Noosa Shire different like by nature, it would be great to add a number five, and this is just a thought, um, a commitment to sustainability. I, I think that we need to make a little bit, no a bit more noise about Noosa Shire being different by nature, and maybe reference even to our Noosa environment strategy. I actually had to look for that, um, and it's actually a really great piece of work that I would love resurfaced and as a council for us to workshop. And that's the big picture stuff about sustainability, climate change adaptation. There's just so much good stuff in that, but that would be my only um, note, um, that if we can, just consider commitment to sustainability, that we must operate in a manner which considers long-term environmental, social and financial implications. So moving that value into a principle. But other than that, um, I love it and I know that I'm gonna keep it somewhere really handy um, in my home office um, so I can refer to it. Um, in particular, like I said, conflict of interest, which is what community asks and questions we need to ask to ascertain whether or not um, we should leave the room or stay in the room. So thank you. Great piece of work, Diana. Can we move it, Council? No. I'll move it. Move it, Council Rocky. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, all in favour? Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank, thank you, Diana. Great work. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Thank you. Move on to item four. Community Kenya. 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 To be fair, it does have the word tenure and tender in it. Would you like to give us a bit of an overview on why this item is before us today? Sure. Um, as you would know by now, each year we put um, this report up uh, which identifies expiring community tenure. Mm -hmm. And we identify any groups that are in the next 12 months either renewing or new tenure to be um, prepared for not-for-profit groups. Um, under the legislation, we must first come to council and get um, resolution to apply an exemption to uh, not go out for public tender, not tenure. <laughs> uh, and that's why this uh, report is before you. As you can see, there's only two groups for the next 12 months that we require new tenure for. I think all we're up to date with most of our expired tenure. And the period of those leases will be part of that lease agreement coming yes, before us yep. once, once complete. Yep, that's right. And that's all um, outlined in our, our tender policy about what, um, what we can and can't do. So it's negotiated all in compliance with that. I, I guess one of the reasons why you've you sought this exemption is because there are no other groups who are actively seeking tenure over those groups. No, that's right. Yeah. Yep. And um, so with these particular ones, they have been on site without 
um, formal tender, uh, ten, now tenure. I'm saying ten, yeah. <laughs> formal tenure for quite some time. So they are existing. It was just under a more informal agreement. Now they would like it formalised, yeah. which is what we've been working towards with some of these groups mm -hmm. with historical informal agreements. So would it be fair to say if there was a situation where you had multiple groups showing interest in yep. either of these areas, you would go to... Expression of interest. Correct. Yep, absolutely. Yep. No, happy to move it. Yeah. 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 All in favour? Yeah. Thank you, Council. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5, appointment of 2023 show holiday. This is CEO. My oh, first show holiday. My first show holiday in Noosa. Um, th thank you, Chair. Um, 9th of September is when um, the show holiday has been um, put forward. Okay. And we do need to formalise that. The 8th of September. 8th of September, sorry. 8th of September. Um, through Council Resolution, we need to formalise um, that show holiday. Um, fairly standard practice across local government in Queensland and um, consistent with uh, show holiday practices in the past here with um, Noosa Shire Council. I'm uh, happy to take any questions on that. Mr. Yes. Mr. CEO, I've just checked the date on the calendar and Friday is the 9th. I thought it was the 9th as well. So it might just be a typo. It's, it's a typo. It's a typo when the yeah. report is the 8th. Yeah. It is the 9th, yes. It is the 9th. Yeah, yeah. quite close. Yeah. Um, mm. Do you want that as a track change or just change it? Just a change in the table will be fine. Thanks, Linda. Uh, but it is, yeah, definitely. It's Friday, Friday the 9th um, here for Noosa Shire. Um, if Claire was here, she would have been able to tell you that without even looking at a calendar. Absolutely, straight away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, any further questions uh, through the chair? I was going to realise this thing here was a living, breathing, walking calendar. No, no, she's very good at working up dates without looking at a calendar. She can work out what day of the week it is. That's, 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 that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, there's nothing further. Uh, I have one question. Yes. Um, given it's a public holiday, and yes. for a lot of small businesses, um, that comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything as a council that we can do to help? And I know that we financially assist the Noosa, um, Noosa Show Day, and we, we assist the association, but is there something more we can do to make the Noosa Show bigger and more epic um, than it already is. I mean, it's to, to announce a public holiday, um, we should be asking the Lisa Show Association, um, you know, live music, we just have a, a weekend of busking and live entertainment at yeah. UP Terrace. And it would be great if there's anything as a council we can do to help, um, I don't know, make it more epic um, and whether Council have, have met with the, the Noosa Show Society um, and discussed um, you know, opportunities. I can, I can see the Director of Community yeah. um, <laughs> jumping at the bit. <laughs> oh, I just think I want to make this huge. Yeah, so, I mean, um, as a kid. Yeah, we've been working with the Show um, Association for a number of years. So they've just been through an evolution, I guess, in their management committee. Um, and the new management committee are looking um, what the future of the show looks like um, and um, you know, we have already undertaken some work with the show study over the years looking at different models because the nature of I guess a, a rural show has changed um, and so they will continue on that process. It's a new committee so we don't want to and they're just coming out the other side of COVID so the first thing for them this year is to really be able to get that show back up and operational um, and then look at, well, what is the future of that? But they, they're already on, on that path and council have already been providing support to them. So this is for in advance? This is for next, next year, year, for 2023. That's what uh, we have to do. So, um, so, Chair, similarly, this year's already been resolved upon, so this report is actually no... Yes, so 2023, yeah. right. my um, mistake. What did you say, 8th of September next year? That's yeah. why we needed um, Her Worship Man here. Oh, to oh, the so it's correct, the 8th of September is... Yes, 2023, 8th of September 2023. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just checking that recommendation. Yeah, not this year, the following year, because yeah. this year's already here, it was done last year. It's always done over a year ago. And it's part of... Excellent. It's part of... Um, uh, 
uh, workplace agreements and all the rest. A absolutely, of yeah. So that that'll be registered with the Industrial Relations Commission as a um, gazetted public holiday for the Noosa Shire local government area. Um, so once resolved upon by the council, um, we'll then send letters through uh, advising that resolution, and then um, that will become a gazetted public holiday for our LGA um, for 8th of September 2023 on the Friday. So under in the report, it says under the Holidays Act 1983, the Minister can appoint. Uh, it's actually a requirement to, to provide a, a show day as part of the Industrial Relations Agreement? Um, in show days across Queensland, um, so there, there's an equal amount of public holidays across Queensland, um, and they are very much um, set to local government areas. Um, my understanding, though, is the exception is the Brisbane area because of the, the World Exhibition, the ECA, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that is broader across local government boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, but um, each LGA that has an agricultural or historical show um, will have that show yeah. holiday, um, and that gives equal amount of public holidays across Queensland. Very good. Each area. Yeah. I'll move. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Nothing further? All in favour? The ayes have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. CEO. I'll move on to item six. Reports for notice by the committee. The mobile library replacement plan update. We have our libraries team here. Yes. Rachel and Tracy. Hi, how are you? Oh, well, it's a bit of an update on where we're at with our mobile library replacement. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. Hello. Um, so my name is Rachel. If you've not met me before, before I'm the branch library's team leader. Uh, so the report you've got in front of you provides an update to our mobile project plan and includes the progress on our mobile vehicle and where we are with our library kiosks as well. So it includes a schedule, you'll see. And we anticipate that our new mobile vehicle will hit the road by the end of the year. We've actually just had our Prigion kiosk installed and we're expecting the Pomona kiosk to be installed in the next month or so. Um, and the project is on track to being allocated <coughs> within our allocated budget. Cool. Yeah. 70,000 to spare. <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. There's a little bit of water to fill under the bridge. Yeah. There's a little bit of water still to flow under the bridge given mm. the delay in the truck, so therefore that would be a contingency and we'll um, see how we get towards the end of the project. Yes. Mm. Given all the flooding recently, I hope that doesn't stop your vehicle from uh, getting into the road. Any questions, Councillors? I just have a question about the outreach program. Mm. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yep, so... You, yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah. I'm happy I to share. Yes. So libraries have delivered outreach library learning programs um, as part of their core business, but we have decided to put a focus on our outreach programs, particularly to um, Pomona, Kinkin, and Prigian. Pomona and Prigian are our two busiest mobile library locations. Um, so part of this replacement project was extending library service into the community. Um, predominantly, we've put outreach programs into things like schools or daycare centres, but this time we've actually partnered with um, the community houses or delivered programs in the hall, and we've changed the type of program. So we're delivering early literacy programs like story time or um, things around that area or digital literacy programs uh, which we haven't delivered within the community before um, and particularly not in a community venue uh, and they've been received uh, they've been well received we've had nearly 200 people attend those um, and it's fantastic to for libraries to be able to actually deliver services all the way out into Kin Kin mm -hmm. outside of the physical walls. There are opportunities for something more remote like Ridgewood and Pepper as well to get Sort of absolutely, absolutely. So we've started discussions with the federal school around alternative programs that we can deliver there that's more relevant to the community and to the school. 
it's very interesting the type of programs that they have suggested a little bit like they they have a beautiful library in their school but they don't have a librarian so they don't have a qualified specialist in that area and they've discussed with our our youth services team how they would really like a librarian to come in and actually teach the students how to use online resources or really how to understand the Dewey Decimal System and be able to locate information. Mm -hmm. So we are working on delivering different types of services there. In my understanding in the past we used to have uh, a library relationship with Federal. Once the school was built and the library was installed there, the, 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 the relationship changed to some degree and the school was more responsible for the library services in that community. Uh, yes, we cer they certainly stepped up because they had a beautiful library installed with all of the resources. Uh, visitation was really low at that stop once the school moved off that uh, original location on the highway. So we were having constant you know, communications with the current customers that were coming on board as well as the school just to make sure that we were delivering the right services for them. Mm. The school will facilitate the kids or what about the adults in the area with regard to what? Uh, we have spoken to the school about whether or not they'd like a bulk loan and that would service the community members but the community members that we spoke to who were currently using our mobile uh, we could identify were also using Croy Library um, uh, they and were also the Pomona community house the... yes and they were also coming in on Pomona on the market days and using mm -hmm. the mobile library service and we could also identify that they were going up to Gympie so we felt that there were a different way, maybe maybe a more efficient or better way we could provide library services for them. Mm -hmm. And the you're right, the Pomona kiosk and the, and the mobile service will definitely support the community in federal. Mm. So I'm trying to understand the connection between mobile library and the outreach program. So are they do, does the, does something the mobile library goes to a location, the outreach program takes place involving the staff in the mobile library and the books in the mobile library? It can be a bit of both. So I'd, yeah. yeah, so. Has that been happening? I mean, it says it's been happening since mid 2021. Does that mean it's been associated with a big mobile no, library? No, no. We've been delivering uh, independent programs within the community, independent to the vehicle. However, our, and our hope was in outreach services, it used to just be a mobile library and a collection of books. But outreach services now means a whole range of learning opportunities, not just the mobile library, it is our suite of programming. In the future with the new vehicle, we're hoping we can do a bit of both. So we're hoping that we can do mm -hmm. the independent programs at different locations, but because we don't need two operators to operate the smaller vehicle, we can use that uh, resource to be able to send a different library staff member out and when you come on board have that tailored experience where you have a librarian help you with your smart tablet or with your mm -hmm. you know whatever your learning um, need is at that day yep. whereas we, we needed two staff to be able to operate mm -hmm. the big vehicle and service. So I suppose the other thing is thinking of outreach services as an overarching point of view of which you've got our lending library kiosk, you've got our outreach programs and events, and you've got the mobile library service. So outreach being the overview. Mm. Yeah. So when the mobile library goes to Perigian and Pomona, mm -hmm. will it just be to replenish the kiosk? No, it'll be delivering a service. Outreach as well. As well. Yes. And, and people can still go inside the mobile yeah. library. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have the outreach vehicle that will remain on a weekly schedule. We'll have the kiosks that provide um, additional access to the collection out there, and we'll have lifelong learning programming as part of the outreach service as well. So, does it sound like services have declined at all? Sound like it's increased? No, so it, I we think are, the language that yeah. you will hear us change is yeah. changing from mobile library to outreach or community based services. Yeah. Mm. It now becomes mm. a suite of services. Mm. And you're 100% right, right. services increased. aren't reducing, no. the services are actually expanding. Yeah, they, um, yeah, and they, this they, is very much different. around the philosophy of, you know, you've got um, a, an audience who will always come to our facilities, mm. but then you've got a whole lot of users for a whole range of reasons, whether it's time, whether it's access, mm. whether it's they're not quite feeling mm. comfortable in a library, um, because maybe they didn't do well at school, for example, so they don't feel quite comfortable coming mm. to the library. Taking the services to them in spaces that they already are <coughs> comfortable with and engaging with a whole different audience. 
um, and this is able to be achieved through the change in this model and bringing on board a much, much more cost-effective vehicle to operate mm -hmm. and this great new technology that we're trialling in the kiosks. Mm -hmm. That would be a great example of the expansion of services to the community in this mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question. Um, the wrap um, is absolutely stunning with the new vehicle. Very Wonderful, crisp. thank you. Um, it just looks brilliant. Um, just for anyone asking um, why the decision was made for Greg Dries um, to put his artwork on the exterior wrap. Can sure, just get some absolutely. It's yeah. part of the branding and like we can't. Yeah. It is part of the branding, but yeah. Greg Dries, we've had an existing really strong relationship with him for a very long time. He's a well-known author and illustrator and has published a series of children's books and he delivers a range of different literary and cultural workshops within the library service. So we engage Greg as an extension of his work that he did previously or recently with our children's library card. I don't know if I put a photo of it in here. I think here. you did, it's a few pages out. Yeah, page 32. So we love celebrating uh, First Nations, all First Nations people in our community, but we also really acknowledge the importance of having Carby Carby artists work with us on Noosa projects. Um, I've connected with the Carby Carby group to share the design with them. Um, I wanted them to get a sneak preview before of the vehicle that we will be travelling Carby Carby lands before the wider community get to see it. Um, the positive from the feedback from that was really positive. So they, they uh, thought the artwork was um, wonderful. Um, we agreed that it, it is important to have Carby Carby artists involved in future projects and I've shared some suggestions of the possibility of that and one of the, our big key projects next year will be that Noosa Library Service turns 50. It will be our 50th anniversary and Noosa Library Branch uh, has its 30th birthday. So that will be a key project for us next year. And we're really hoping to have an inclusion of Carby Carby presence, um, the artists potentially in our memorabilia for that special event. So we're looking for other future possibilities that we, we can have uh, Carby Carby uh, inclusion in our, in our services. Is there a Baroni a kid you want to in the album? Uh, there is a logo. <laughs> Do you like it? Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. 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 So you can't wait to see it in real life. Yeah. It is. Mm. It looks stunning. Uh, and for those that um, may not be familiar, so, um, Greg Dries um, has been a teacher um, in the federal school for a very long time. Um, so he's local and very well known. And his um, really story good. books through the library service are very, very um, popular. So he has a whole following. Um, young people um, through our service and those of us that aren't so young. Um, so is that, there's that real connection to um, story um, and, um, and the library service. Mm -hmm. Did the image of the vehicle correct in the blue? It's it, the artwork. It's still a concept design. Um, <laughs> the, the, the concept design is all out all on the back. Mm. The, the vehicle yeah. itself is blue. It's, mm. it's, uh, yes, it yes. is at the moment. So. Um, we had this is an our absolute final. So I welcome feedback from you all on the design, uh, but we're fairly close. The design, the design is beautiful. The colour of the front end compared to the side isn't. That's <laughs> my, my, that's my opinion. Is your preference? That's my opinion. White. Uh, well, something other than the blue. If that's the if that's the concept, because the two don't go together. I think it would be great. Again, just a suggestion. Mm. Um, so I note the back of the van says you'll like your library. Mm. It would be great if we just have just this constant reiteration of our vision and who we are, Noosa Green by Nature. That's just a thought. Um, yeah, and right. um, I would love to see that just plastered all over the shy, just to mm -hmm. remind everyone our point of difference, our competitive edge. I understand. I, uh, your life, your library is our library motto. Oh, but me. no, I'm that is okay. <laughs> That's I okay. Yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. Yeah, that there would be it's scope to include a different <laughs> nature. Um, <laughs> I, I think the team could go away and have mm. a look at how that could be worked in. Some Correct. Yeah. yeah. We'll have a look at that. Thank you. Yeah.
the uh, debt funding incorporates some of the artwork as opposed to just the backing. Um, when do you expect to take delivery of the vehicle? Uh, so we're hoping to get delivery... October. October, October yes. So then a few months for fit out and then on the road in yeah. January? Yeah, so we're anticipating the end of the year, um, but so anticipating. So this project, like any other vehicle project, um, has um, been um, subject to the, the, the delays that we are all mm. familiar with. And then all the other materials um, together. And so this mm. vehicle had to come from overseas. Um, we, we were very excited when actually we heard that it arrived in the country. Um, but, mm. you know, that's only the start of the construction journey. So our supply company are then having ongoing issues and being able to get supply of their material. Yeah, um, so true. while we're saying we hope to receive it in October, that is very dependent on them being able to get the supply of materials and the specialists that they need because it's such a specialised vehicle. So the last mobile library required a special licence up in mm. You had one of semi-trailer mm. licence, whatever that is. Heavy rig. Uh, what sort of licence do you need to drive this? This is a medium. Uh, I think a it's, light, actually. Yes, Sorry. we ended up going with a light, yes. a light rigid, which is the one just up from a, mm. from a standard car licence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so already with we've... With the type drivers. Yes, yeah, yeah. so already we've um, discovered that we have another two or three people in our team that could drive the yeah. vehicle now and one councillor fantastic this is on video isn't it so um so we've uh put it out to the staff and there are about three or four people who are yes. interested in getting their license yes. um so we'll see how we go but already you can see the benefits um, mm. in operating smaller vehicle yeah and what's going to happen with our current mobile library is there a graveyard so well, uh, well, council goes through a disposal of assets process. Yep. So, um, although it's reached the end of life for us, it will go through um, a process and things. So, for the, the prime mover itself, um, there's, there's still a lot of life left yeah. in the prime mover. Um, the trailer, um, you know, anyone that's seen it recently, it's really come to the end of its life. Um, however, you know, our hope is. Um, like any of our things, that, that there's a repurpose, a reuse, or at the very least a recycle. We, we've been approached by a number of people that can see, you know, tiny home, etc., in it. Um, so it will go through a council disposal process. Yeah. I, can, I can see a coastal care building, mm. maybe. No? On wheels, yeah. On, I'm serious, on wheels. At the moment, it does have some significant um, waterproofing yeah. issues, shall I say? So I wouldn't imagine um, in the year that we would be looking at retaining it. Isn't it a new trail? No. Okay. Nothing further, councillors? No. Can I move her? Dr. Wookie, second Councillor Lawrenceton, all in favour? Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.